everyone. Welcome to our webinar, The Global Shark Crisis in 2022. Thank you so much for joining us today and greetings to those who will be watching the recording on YouTube. I'm Lucia Gai, the co-founder and the managing director of the Institute of Animal Law of Asia, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Institute of Animal Law of Asia, or ILA, is the educational research center that focuses on animal law issues in Asia and the world. At the ILA, we provide research projects which include animal law in Asian countries, on topic, on category, and on species animal law articles. Last year, we have launched a few external projects under the Global Ambassador Program. This include enhancing legal regulations for aquatic animals in Kazakhstan, farmed animal welfare in mainland China, and amplifying the interests of animals in Kazakhstan. All of these are sponsored and supported by the Center for Animal Law Studies, Lewis and Clark Law School. At the ILA, we have our own news source, Asia Animal Law Bulletin, which provides the latest updates on animals in Asian countries and regions, and also our recent initiative, the Alliance for Animal Law of Asia, which is the international networking campaign that aims to cooperate with national, regional, and global animal organizations through legal uh, education, collaboration, online events, and webinars, as well as inviting experts to share their knowledge and experience in, with our audience. Um, our members are spread across the globe from Asian organizations in China, India, Japan, Indonesia, and Vietnam, to the organizations on other continents, including North America, South America, Europe, and Africa. Since February 2021, we have held quite a few webinars in case you missed them. Um, the recordings are available on our website. It's ilasia.org slash events, or you can go to our YouTube channel. Um, it's Institute of Animal Law of Asia, um, and you can find the recordings up there. Don't forget to check out our website. It's ilasia.org and find us on social media. It's Animal Law Asia on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Currently, I am the ambassador of the Global Ambassador Program, the initiative launched by the Center for Animal Law Studies, Lewis and Clark Law School. And today's webinar is organized under the project I'm leading, Enhancing Legal Regulations for Aquatic Animals in Kazakhstan. And this wouldn't have been possible without the CAL support. Our guest today is Andrea Ricci, the executive director of the Hong Kong Shark Foundation. Um, since 2015, she has worked and volunteered for the Hong Kong Shark Foundation in many capacities, most recently as the executive director, raising awareness about shark conservation and educating people to stop eating shark fin soup and all shark products. We'll be answering questions after the presentation, so please drop your questions in the Q&A box. Thank you so much for being with us today, Andrea, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, uh, and, uh, Lou and to Hall. That's really great. This is truly an international Zoom call today. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be here, and it's my pleasure to have met you recently um, when I saw a video of you giving a talk for Lewis and Clerk Law School. That was great. Um, you know, the Pacific Northwest is very near and dear to my heart, having grown up in Seattle and gone to Seattle University Law School. So um, I am really pleased to be here today to talk to you about an update on sharks. And we're going to talk about the global shark crisis and, you know, why we need sharks. This is something maybe people in Kazakhstan or Inner Mongolia might not really understand understand because they're so not connected with the ocean, but it's all connected. All Everything we do every day is all connected. It's part of cl the climate. It's part of the planet. So um, yes, if no problem, I'll go ahead and share my screen. And, um, you know, today my talk is going to be, whoops, about sharks and why we need them. So let me just this over. Okay. So um, 
you know, I started, uh, I came to Hong Kong about 30 years ago. And um, I, I used to work for a law firm in a capacity of a corporate communications and, uh, and in HR. Uh, but I, after many years, I decided to leave and do some work um, as a volunteer. And that was in 2015. And since then, I haven't looked back. I, um, I've been at the Shark Foundation since 2015. And I encourage anybody out there, whether you're a student or whether you're a lawyer or, you know, neither of those to get involved in the community. And um, let me just grab my friend over here. And, you know, getting involved with people like, with, with animals like this, I think are really important. And we're gonna talk today about what is the problem and why we need to work together to find a solution. So I, I started in 2015 by seeing a presentation and I was pretty blown away. I realized that over 100 million sharks are killed every year. Now that is just for their fins. And in fact, I even have a fin right here. This is a real shark fin. Uh, more than 100 million sharks are killed every year, but that is just for shark fin soup. The numbers are even more staggering. According to marine biologists, it, the numbers of sharks killed every year are more like 270 million a year. 270 million a year, that's pretty mind boggling. Here in Hong Kong, we are definitely the trade capital of the world for shark fin soup. In fact, 50% of the global shark fin trade is coming right here through Hong Kong. And this is a great picture situated um, in a town in part of Hong Kong called Kennedy Town. And what this is showing you is that even when you're walking down the street and you can see shops selling shark fin soup, shark fins for shark fin soup, even above you are hundreds of thousands more every day of shark fins being dried for consumption to be sold. We're talking about a global shark crisis. We're talking about the fact that it's not only cruel, but it's unsustainable. It's unsustainable for so many reasons, and we're going to go into that. But, you know, sharks are low producers and slow producers. Uh, they just don't produce enough. Um, baby sharks are called pups. We just don't have the numbers, and we're decimating them faster. In this picture, circled in red, you can see one of the 12 CITES uh, um, endangered near extinction sharks, and this shark is a hammerhead. But you see, this picture is taken in Somali, and they don't, um, those fishermen have no idea about what they've caught. But clearly, they know that they, these sharks are worth money. They know that capturing these sharks can help their basic, uh, their families can pay for their, their bills. So, but we need to retrain them and um, we need to teach people about there's a limitation on the sharks in the environment. Now, sharks are 400 million years old. That's 200 million years older than dinosaurs. So they've been around a long time. But why are sharks important? Well, the basic premises are that they enable bio, excuse me, they enable biodiversity by culling the sick, the slow. Sharks are opportunists. They go after the weak, they go after the shark, the fish that are sick, and they take care of those populations, which keeps the marine system balanced. That allows them to maintain healthy marine ecosystems. And that's super important. They also maintain food webs. You know, through the migrations and sharks going all over thousands of miles and up and down uh, in the ocean, that allows the sharks to help cycle nutrients across different locations and between the deep and shallow oceans. They also manage the climate. You know, oceans are major, major carbon sinks. 
and they're sources of oxygen. So sharks play an important part in regulating that those the population that they prey on. They are apex predators. They're at the top of the food chain. Um, who's at the top above the sharks? Really, it's man. Humans are at the top of the food chain. Um, yes, orcas are are to they're known to attack sharks and kill them but as a whole sharks are way more worried about humans you know we get 50 percent of our air and 50 percent of our water from the ocean so it's important that we keep these apex predators alive and that we do everything we can to keep them going you know, this is a great uh, example of what we do. This, we just had this, um, some students did this last week, two weeks ago in Hong Kong. Um, it's where they, kids took some boxes and put different types of uh, fish and animals from the ocean onto the boxes. And then like a Jenga game, they tried to pull out the boxes um, one by one. And that illustrates for students how delicate the ecosystem is in our ocean. You know, sharks have great sense of um, great senses. They have six different senses, and one of them, which is their strongest, which is their sense of smell. I mean, they can smell up to kilometers away. So um, I always teach my kids and people that you know, sharks are pretty can find you if you're moving around, but um, they're just such unique, beautiful creatures. Now, what are sharks used for? Well, here in Asia, they're used mostly for shark fin soup. We did a survey in 2016, and we found that 98% of Hong Kong's Chinese seafood restaurants serve shark fin. We estimate there's probably over 3,000, 4,000 Chinese seafood restaurants in Hong Kong, but unfortunately, only four restaurants out of about 4,000 only serve, do not serve shark fin soup, only serve non shark fin menus. So that's not good enough for us. I think we need to work harder as a global citizen and in convincing restaurants why they need to stop serving shark fin soup. And that's what we work on. What I have a picture of here is the most gentle and the largest of the shark family, which is a whale shark. And whale sharks actually no longer have any teeth. They have evolved, but um, uh, they're, um, they're also the gentlest and so it's the most vulnerable. People love to go swimming with them uh, and feed them because they're that, that gentle. And uh, they're filter feeders. You know, the, wa the water goes in their mouths. And from that, they filter through the gills on their side of their body. They filter the food and the oxygen to survive. So um, uh, people get to know them. And it's such, they're such a beautiful creature. But because they're so gentle and slow, they're also one of the 12 near extinct sharks. Because like this man who's smiling, you know, the shark fin, he can get a huge one from a, uh, from a whale shark and he can make a lot of money. And, you know, I asked that question to seven and eight year olds and I asked them, why do you think this man is smiling? And I'll tell you, they all get the answer. And that to me is a pretty sad state of affairs when we as a culture can um, know as a five or six or seven year old that the man is smiling because he's killed and exploited an endangered species just so he could make money. I think we need to work harder. Now, maybe some of you didn't know this, but um, fish and chips have become more and more popular with shark meat. Now, the reason for that is the most common type of meat used in a fish and chip for centuries has been cod. But about the late 80s, maybe mid 80s, the cod industry actually collapsed globally because what we did was the demand went up and then the um, supply went down because we overfished the cod. That's exactly what we're doing to sharks now. We are overfishing them and they cannot replenish fast enough. 
You know, in Australia, they call char, um, the shark meat that they use, they give it a fake name and they call it flake. And in New Zealand, they call it lemon fish. And in the UK, they call it rock salmon. So the fish and chip shops are buying shark, giving it fake names and then selling it and people don't realize what they're eating. In fact, one of my students uh, from the University of Exeter, um, they did some tests on a fish and chip shop in um, the southern part of England. And in that fish and chip shop, they didn't know people were eating hammerhead shark. So, you know, we need to be aware as consumers about what we're doing and what our, um, our actions are. And we did ask questions, right? Now, what is very popular in Hong Kong and in Asia, especially in China, Macau, Singapore, Taiwan, is um, for people to take shark liver oil. So when I was growing up, my grandmother was always trying to get me to eat a spoonful of shark of, of cod liver oil. But we don't really do that anymore because we have overfished cod and there's just not that demand and it's too expensive now. So what the fishermen have done is they have switched to um, taking the liver, the oil out of the liver of the sharks and then selling that as a commodity. And they sell it to usually women uh, for, they say it's good for your skin, anti-aging, fatiguing, fatigue, anti-fatigue. But in fact, there is no scientific data at all to support that this is good for us. And it's really sad because the sharks are, are suffering because of this. So it's not only shark fin soup now, it's all these other products that are being marketed in the world, which is driving the demand up and the level of shark um, population down. Squalene is what this shark liver oil is. And it's also being sold in, to makeup uh, uh, manufacturers where they're putting it in lipstick. So I... In, Encourage people that when you're going to buy a new lipstick or a moisturizer, that you please check the label and look at the label to see if there's cruelty free, if the product is cruelty free, if the if the product is animal product free. You know, when we're talking about animals rights, we have to look beyond it. We can't just look one way. We have to look all different ways. And one of the ways you can do is look at the uh, makeup industry, for example, um, because of this use of shark liver oil and squalene in the makeup industry, South Korea and Indonesia actually are tied for like third in the world for shark consumption. You know, South Korea is well known for the women's makeup and beauty industry and shark liver oil is greatly used. And so we have to educate people to be aware consumers and not use these products. You know, you can get the skin of the shark and have it made into shoes or belts and bags right here in Hong Kong. There are several shops that still do that. But the number one country in the world that is not only makeup and leather, but also steaks and they love to eat shark steaks is Italy. Italy is the second largest consumer in the world of shark products, number one in Europe. And this is a great example here of, um, I found this on the internet. This is an American uh, ad for somebody, a chef saying that you can, how to prepare a shark steak from the Mako shark. And the Mako shark is one of 12 sharks in the world that are near extinction. And here is this person advocating how to eat it. So clearly there is um, a disconnect between the problem of near extinction and the consumption. I took this, um, I got this picture sent to me. This is somebody that was in the Midwest of the United States in a place called Ohio. And this is being sold at a, um, I think it's called International Gyms grocery chain. And this is a um, very iconic and endangered species. This is a hammerhead, a juvenile hammerhead being sold. It is near extinction. 
it is protected by law in the United States. And here, this grocery chain is just, you know, wantonly flaunting that you can cat, you can get it, buy it, and probably turn it into steaks. The animal food industry, uh, pet food industry, is also a huge purchaser of shark products. They take the scraps. So, for example, if you were cutting off the fin and then you had some leftover scraps. They sell it to the shark industry, uh, sorry, to the pet food industry. And here is a great example. One of my students in Hong Kong found this chewy toy. It's cartilage, which is what this shark fin is. This is cartilage, just like your nose and your ear. So they're selling this cartilage to pet owners as a chewing um, toy, as, as a chewing um, treat for their dogs. So, you know, I believe that when the buying stops, then the killing stops. So I really encourage people not to buy products like this. We have to send a message to the manufacturers that this is not acceptable. So for a little history lesson um, here in China, how did shark fin soup start? How did it become so popular? Well, it goes back over a thousand years to like 960 AD in the Song Dynasty, when this gentleman, my friend, Mr. Mei Yao Chen, he wrote a poem about shark fin soup. So he wrote a poem and the emperor saw this supposedly and started to make shark fin soup as per the poem. And then it became a status symbol. So people in China wanted to serve at their big parties, their weddings, at their grandma's 88th birthday, whatever it was, company banquets. They wanted to start serving shark fin soup, just like the emperor was having, basically for face or mianzi, as we say in Chinese. Um, they wanted to impress their friends and colleagues and serve something at their party, which was also eaten by the emperor. Now, fast forward that to a thousand years, and what you have in the 80s was a very popular campaign we call the Big Four. And this is Bao Sam Chi To in Cantonese or Bao Shen Chi Du in Mandarin. So, what are these four products? These are four of the most expensive seafood products that you can get. This is abalone, is the first one, and then sea cucumber which isn't a cucumber at all. It is in fact an animal. It is a sea slug. The third one is chi or yu chi, which is shark fin. And the last one is du or shark, uh, sorry, fish maw. But fish maw is actually fish bladder. And what they do is take the bladder and then they blow it up and they dry it and then they sell it and then they chop it up just like the shark fin and they serve it in a broth. Now, the thing about shark fin soup is these shark fins, like the cartilage in your ears or your nose, it's a soft bone, has no taste. I'm going to repeat that. Shark fin soup has no taste. What it has is texture, and what it has is a ex very expensive price tag. I have seen shark fin on sale in Hong Kong for 2,000 US dollars per kilo. 2,000 US dollars per kilo right? That can serve a lot of people, but that's a very expensive wedding item to have. And so I just feel we can be better. We can stop the buying. We stop the killing. That's something we say in Chinese, mayo mai mai, jo mayo sa hai. This is a great picture taken in Hong Kong. Look at the size of those shark fins. I mean, can you imagine how big this beautiful, majestic creature must have been? So they just take a part of the shark when they need it, when they're making it. So remember, this broth is what gives it the flavor. Shark fin soup, actually, the shark fin has no flavor. It's the broth that the chefs make, and you can see the big pot of broth there. That is what gives the shark fin soup its flavor. So what we're dealing with now actually is something called overfishing. This is what is driving the sharks to near extinction. And sharks are in the traditionally been part of bycatch. But I just read a report last week that's saying that more and more fishermen are actually targeting sharks because of their heavy value. Because of their great profitability, they are targeting sharks and selling them overseas. 
you know, fishermen with a second grade education in Costa Rica or Spain or wherever they might be, they know that if they catch a shark and they sell it, it will be worth a lot of money in Asia. It's really well known. We need to change that mindset is our opinion at, shark, at Hong Kong Shark Foundation. I know that sharks are kind of scary. We've probably all seen Megalodon or Jaws, but what's really scary actually is that every year more people are killed by selfies than they are by shark attacks. Yes, people die around six to eight people a year die from shark attacks when in fact selfies kill anywhere from 40 to 50 people a year. So if you're taking a selfie, please be careful. I learned something very interesting from some very famous marine biologists a few years ago, that the country that eats the most shark is in fact not China, it's not the United States, it's not you know, Australia or Britain. In fact, it is, whoops, it is Brazil. It is Brazil that has 121 million people, has a very large population of people who struggle to feed their family, and they have a large coastline and they have a lot of seafood in their diet, just like we do here in Hong Kong. So they are people that don't eat the shark fin, but they eat the rest of the shark and they process the rest of it. And they are the largest consumers of shark products in the world. I think it's important to point out for people who are still not convinced that shark fin soup actually is very poisonous. And what, is the, what are the poisons that are in shark fins and shark meat? Lead, mercury, and arsenic are the three largest. In fact, they're in a lot of apex predators like um, swordfish and, and other large um, uh, fish-eating predators. They are, um, you know, these, these, they are subject to bioaccumulation. And that's where when the little shark uh, the, sorry, the little fish every day are eating the um, other things in the ocean, plankton, phytoplankton, and the sharks have to eat a lot of the little fish. Well, that's called bioaccumulation. And that happens then with something called biomagnification. So that means that the shark fin is having a lot of poison. Um, it's from pollution in the ocean, like PCBs and microplastics. Microplastics from if you are using single serving plastic bottles, for example, I hope we're not, um, you know, it comes from pollution in the sky, from factories, from your home. It's runoff from the rivers and the ocean, it goes into the ocean and it goes down the food chain. And then that biomagnification happens where it all concentrates and you eat that shark and then that goes into your body. So I highly recommend you from a health standpoint to not eat shark fin soup or any type of shark products. In fact, this is a company in Hong Kong called Watson's and they have a huge campaign called Go Green. And um, I talk to my students and educate them about the irony that if you're buying a single use plastic, right? You're not reducing, you're not reusing. If you're buying a single use plastic and you, if you really want to go green, you will stop utilizing their product. Um, there's no excuse for this. This is not a sustainable product. So I hope all of you use your sippy cup and your reusable bottles and try to reduce and reuse plastics so that it doesn't go into the ocean. of you uh, listeners would might be all over the world or you, you might be right here in Asia, but um, we can all take action. And that's part of what I try to teach kids about, that we can be part of the change. We can be part of the solution. So let me give you some easy solutions that you can do anywhere. First of all, people can take a pledge and say no to shark fin soup. Uh, we are now coming up on Chinese New Year on February 1st here in China. And so what we're trying to encourage people to do is at this high time of the year where you're with family and where you're spending time with your loved ones, 
please do not choose shark fin soup when you're going out for a meal. Um, this is the, lar the, the biggest time of the year for consumption of shark products. So if everybody could take that pledge and educate their family members, you know, about why we shouldn't eat shark fin soup at this time of the year, then that would be a great step forward. You can also help us take action by, I have a QR code here, by being a part of a petition we have um, against this restaurant called Dao Hong. And Dao Hong has 88 seafood restaurants just in Hong Kong alone. And we're asking them to stop serving shark fin at the restaurant in Hong Kong, the restaurants in Hong Kong. So we're still working on that. And if you want to help us, you can sign our petition and circulate it on your social media or amongst your friends and help us to get more signatures. That would be great. You know, we've done this before. Um, we did it with a restaurant called Maxime's and Victory. We worked on them for two years and they actually pulled shark fin from their 55 seafood restaurants. And that was a huge victory. That was in January 1, 2020. You know, we also asked Cathay Pacific, which is an airline here, to stop shipping shark products. Before we talked to them, they were shipping, um, they said, sustainable shark products. But we convinced them that there's no such thing as sustainable shark products. Because what is sustainable or eatable from um, a demand level aspect Today, tomorrow could be down on the chain and uh, near extinction. So we're asking people to not, uh, to airlines and shipping lines to not transport it. And we had a victory in 2018. They agreed to stop shipping any of shark products. This is a, a, a company that was using shark fin soup and as part of their social media, we asked them to pull that because they, they sell kitchen products and they did. And that's again, an example of what you could do, we could do together. This is Food Panda, it's a delivery company and um, good on WWF. They asked Food Panda to pull all the shark fin soup products from their menu. And they ended up pulling 452 shark products from their menus. And so that's a start. It's not available. When the buying stops, then the killing stops. We have a campaign here uh, for shark-free weddings. So we try to encourage young people that when they're going to get married, that they don't have shark fin soup. You know, the whole reason why you have shark fin at a wedding is because it's one of the most important expensive items you can buy. And so people were told by the restaurants, remember the balsam chito, the fourth big things, they were told by restaurants that this is what you need to have a happy marriage or to have a successful wedding. And that success actually comes from um, impressing your friends with a very expensive spread. So we hope to encourage young people like Bonnie and, and her husband here who had a wedding and they had no shark fin soup. But what they did was they left these shark facts about how sharks are disappearing and how sharks, uh, it's unsustainable to fish for sharks and to eat sharks. So they are true shark heroes for us. We also have a campaign about shark being a shark-free company. So if you work in a company and you want to be a part of corporate social responsibility, for example, you can reach out to me and we can work on your company being a shark-free company. Super simple. All you have to do is tell your employees that on any, country, uh, any company events, any banquets or anything, there'll be no consumption of shark fin soup at any company banquets. And that's so easy to do. If you're interested, reach out to me and let me know. You know, corporate social responsibility is really something very important. And this campaign, this Shark Free Company campaign is something you can get involved in with your company, whether it's ESG or CSR. So this is a trend and something I think a lot of young people are really, uh, they're really interested in being involved in this movement. But more importantly, young people today want to work for a company 
that is switched on, that cares about the environment, that cares about sustainability, that cares about our oceans and our animals. So please, if you're interested in being more involved, reach out to me, we can work on that together. We're very much into the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We are um, working with companies like this in Hong Kong to be shark-free companies. Um, we also have an education program called the Shark Ambassador Program. Our education program is so successful. In fact, in 2021, just finishing last month, I spoke to over 10,000 students. And in 2019, before COVID hit us, 11,000 students. So we're in over 15 secondary schools. It's a great way for kids to understand how they can give back and be active in a service that helps the community. Uh, this is a great example of um, what we've had to do during COVID. We are Zooming with kids. Here I talk to 720 school kids over Zoom, giving the same kind of talk that I'm giving to you today. This is an example of kids in school with their masks on that we did. This was 140 local kids in Hong Kong, all saying no to shark fin soup. This is an example of what kids can do. They can get active in their own school. And then as shark ambassadors, those kids can then go and take the message out, not only to their classmates, but to their families. And I think that's really important. These are great pictures of kids who are very involved in their school and in their community. These are at, uh, this is all pre-COVID too, but this is, uh, it just shows you the community spirit and how people, kids really get it. They want to give back, very important. We're very involved with different organizations around the world trying to raise awareness about shark conservation. You know, there's over 500 species of shark in the world, right? And they're always discovering new species, but there's only 12 that are protected by law under the CITES treaty. And um, in Hong Kong, the government recognizes those 12 species. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that here. Um, some of you are interested in law. Uh, in Hong Kong, the law that rep protects animals is CAP 536. That is the Protection of Endangered Species of Animals and Plants Ordinance. And just recently on August 18th, we had a new change. The problem with PISAPO CAP 536, was that it only went after the mules, the little guy who was carrying the cargo, the endangered species back and forth. So what we had a problem with is that only customs or the agricultural and fisheries department, only they had the power to seize cargo, then go and test it. Because some of you might not know, but the only way you can know what kind of species of shark this is that I'm holding in my hand right now is if you do a DNA test. A DNA test will tell us what kind of species, but you've got to seize the cargo. That's expensive. That's taking it away from people to, that are trying to sell it. You are, um, it's cost money to do the testing of the DNA of that species. So there's a lot of problems with it. So people are reluctant to seize unless they really know what kind of species it is and that it's in fact really endangered. So we had a lot of problems with that. We were able to convince the government August 18th of 2021 that we needed to bring in this whole endangered species um, under a new law. And um, because what we have found that in the world, uh, endangered species like pangolin and tiger and ivory and shark are now really uh, sold through organized crime. And uh, the organized cr criminals are not just selling endangered species, but what they're also selling are um, uh, human trafficking, drugs, prostitution, 
um, money laundering. So we have tried to um, convince the government that they should bring in the same 12 protected species under 580, 536 and bring it in under cap 455, which is the Organized and Serious Crimes Ordinance. So we um, were successful with other organizations. We got together, other animal rights groups. We got together, it was a long process. We petitioned the government and uh, through a, um, a member of the legislative council here, we were able to convince the chief executive and then the rest of LegCo to pass it. And now what that means for us as lawyers and as, as legal people, we're able to have the power to seize, not only to seize the cargo, but to, to follow the paper trail up to the kingpins. And that means we can seize assets, we can go and seize um, revenue, seize um, proceeds in their bank account, we can follow the paper trail, and we can, in a court, utilize the evidence that we legally were able to find and utilize it in court when giving evidence against them to get a secure conviction. So this was a big game changer for us. Where is it now? Um, uh, the government is still getting their head wrapped around how this new ordinance will work and how they're going to train their people, whether it's the police or customs or ag and fish. Um, they're still working on procedures. To the best of my knowledge, since August 2021, when the law passed, there have not been any seizures under the new cap, um, cap 455. 455, sorry, that's a mistake up there. Cap 455. Um, so we're hoping that it changes soon. We're hoping that they will engage more people. Now, social media is very powerful for us. So maybe I can ask all of the listeners that um, if you like what you hear today, maybe you can reach out to us on Instagram or LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, Twitter, or even Weibo in China and like us. That will help us to increase our numbers and to help us to raise awareness. Be the ch change. I think that's the important message today that all of you listening, I thank you, but all of you listening should understand that you have the ability to make even just a little change, but that can make a difference. If there's one movie that you watch, I highly recommend that you watch the movie called Seaspiracy, which is on Netflix. It really talks to you about the commercial fishing disaster we have going on right now in the open seas and how overfishing is calling, causing the destruction of not only sharks, but many other animals, aquatic animals in the ocean. Um, this is a great video. This is um, a video that another organization called Wild Aid did, and it's with uh, someone named Yao Ming. You may have heard of him. He played for the Houston Rockets. And this is very popular with young people, especially boys. So I just thought I'd play this for you to give you an idea of the impact that media can have, especially when you have a celebrity. What if you could see how shark fin soup is made? If you could see how each year up to 70 million sharks are killed to end up in soup, could you still eat it? A third of all shark species are nearly extinct, but we can help save them. Remember, when a buying stops, the king can too. And what's so great about that is the mayo my mind, Joe Mayo Sahai, when the buying stops, the killing tan too, makes so much sense. And it's so easy for all of us to do. And uh, so I, I, I thank you for your time. And I thank you to Lou and Sahal for letting me speak. Um, but that is a little bit about the current shark situation, shark crisis around the world. And I'm open to talking to anybody after this event. Please reach out to me to, on any of our social media sites or on our website, Hong Kong Shark Foundation. And if you want to volunteer or be an intern, or if you want to have a shark, get your company to be a shark-free company, please let me know. I would love to work with you. So thanks very much, everybody. My contact information here at the bottom. And 
if you would like to take our Google survey, um, I put together a survey because I want to measure, um, I want to measure whether or not when somebody is going to listen to my talk, has it changed their mind? You know, did you think it was okay to eat shark fin soup before, but then after hearing my, my talk, you realize that it's not a sustainable practice um, and that you've changed your mind? I want to hear about that. That helps us uh, to determine KPIs for us moving forward so that people know we're really making an impact. So with your help, I can make more of an impact and, and save more sharks. So thank you very much and I appreciate your time. And over to you, Lou. Thanks so much, Andrea, for shedding light on this very important issue. Um, yeah, it's uh, such a global, problem around the world, especially among animal rights activists, unfortunately, due to wrong um, demonstration of uh, sharks as animals, um, illustrating them as very um, dangerous animals, although uh, in reality, only a few species of sharks are dangerous. And uh, But yeah, I always say that animals do not attack if you do not provoke them. And so, yes, it is, I think it's very crucial to um, raise the global awareness about um, the importance to protect animals. And thanks so much for doing this wonderful presentation. We're gonna shift to our questions. Um, the first question is, um, hi, Andrea, do you have any suggestions for speaking for sharks while avoiding ra racial discrimination? Can you read that to me again, please? Is it in the chat? Uh, yes, it's a, it's in the Q&A box. Do you have any suggestions for speaking for sharks while avoiding racial discrimination? Well, I, I think I, I have to be honest, I'm not really sure how to answer that because I'm not sure what they're asking. Can, can, well, can I, I think the attendee means um, that usually when people speak about shark fin soup, it is referred to China and maybe it sounds kind of uh, racist. I suppose something like this. Well, I live in China. So I, I don't think that's an issue. You know, um, death is death. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it's not, it's, it, it, here, I'll tell you why that, I'll tell you why I just have, uh, a per, I'm perplexed by that because it's though it started out, though it started out as a um, a, a Chinese thing, as you saw originally, it's actually been picked up in countries where ethnically Chinese are um, are, are not the biggest buyer. For example, Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Malaysia are four of the biggest consumers of shark fin soup right now. And the, ethnically, they're not even Chinese. Well, what has happened is they took on the trait, they saw Chinese people having big parties and, and big influential, you know, face making, right? Like I've got to impress everybody, right? That's, you know, that's conspicuous consumption. That's where you go to lunch with your Gucci wallet and your Louis Vuitton purse, and you have a Lamborghini and you want to show off, right? That's called conspicuous consumption. You want people to see that you're spending a lot of money, you know, on your purse or your goods or your shoes or whatever it is. But that includes seafood. You know, in a culture, in, especially in Asia, people order food to impress other people. So the area that's growing, and I thought I made that point in my talk, is that um, it's not a Chinese China problem, right? It's it's a global problem. It's a global shark crisis, and this is something that we have to be aware of. You know, um, there's no discrimination. Murderers are murderers, and the killing sharks, 270 a year. It's it's not about being Chinese or being any ethnicity. So um, I think we have to be aware of the bigger picture. And when I go to schools, I'm very careful not to finger point that this is a China thing. I do that by showing statistics and showing data that the largest growth is not is the country that eats the most shark, for example, is Brazil. It's not even China, right? 
or the second largest consuming country is Italy. Again, not China, right? So I'm very careful not to um, make the mistake of, of, of China bashing or pointing a finger at China when even though they might have started that tradition, right? I tried to make that point, I hope I did, that this is now a global crisis and what is the real, what is the real driving factor behind um, eating shark is money. It's making a profit and getting face and having that conspicuous consumption. So, um, you know, in Asia where I'm a minority um, and discriminated against every day, okay? Um, I don't even talk about that because uh, it's just about saving the sharks. Yeah, um, I totally agree with you. Uh, when I'm told that this is a, the express some kind of expression of racism, I always say that I don't care who is killing sharks and the other animals because it's not about the country, it's not about the ethnicity. Um, the next question is, what do you think would be if the effective method to educate the public about the issue of shark fishing and shark finning, given that sharks are wrongly illustrated in movies and tales? Yeah. Education. Education. Education, education, education. That's why you and I came up with this idea. So why don't we like just do a, a, a little interview, you know, let me do a presentation and talk to people how in just a simple way they can be a part of the movement. You know, our mission is five words, raise awareness about shark conservation. So how, if you go to our Instagram or our Facebook page or LinkedIn, that will give you a great example of how we raise awareness and how we work with people, especially students to get creative, do artwork, make videos, um, do internships, um, create um, fundraisers, you know, it, the world's your ocean. So if any of the listeners are interested in raising awareness, even in Kazakhstan, for example, right? Do what you did, Lou. You, you know, I'm, I'm, people like you are doing a great job. Keep it up. We need young people like you to carry the baton forward. You know, I, I'm, I'm getting older and I need young people like you and young people like the lady who asked, or a man who asked that question, right? Get on it. Don't be afraid, right? Make a difference. It's really important that we're not passive. You know, if you're not, complaining about it, you're part of the problem. And, and there's a very famous lady, Dr. Sylvia Earle. She said, we know everyone can't do everything, but everyone can do something, okay? So if you're concerned about the planet, you know, or if you're concerned about recycling or you're concerned about animals' rights, then join an organization or speak up to your friends or use social media, you know, for an NGO or a charity, as you probably know, Lou, it's, it's a godsend for us, right? Because it, it doesn't cost us anything and we can engage with people. And, you know, even on what's that clubhouse, which is very popular in the United States and in the UK, clubhouse is something that a lot of people, like six months ago, really during the pandemic, I was talking on clubhouse constantly to other animal rights people, you know, it was a way for us to link up where we maybe never have it. It's kind of died down a little bit, sadly, but if anybody's interested, just reach out, you know, email someone like me, if it's dogs you're into or whatever, if you're really worried about something, reach out to the organization and give it a try. You know, everybody can do something and everyone can make a difference. Yes, this is true. And I was so excited to hear what you do for educating this um, young people, kids, who uh, who is our future, probably animal rights advocates. And I mean, yeah. who knows? You know, um, you, you know what we are? We are farmers, right? Animal yeah. rights activists, everybody are farmers. And we plant the seeds of change, okay? 
And whether you're out protesting or whether you're talking to your neighbor or whether you're in a restaurant, you know, explaining to the person why you're a vegan, right? You know, I personally am a vegan and I'm a vegan for animals, of course, uh, for my health, but for all of you, for the planet, right? You know, vegans are not just vegans because of one reason. We're vegans for lots of reasons. For, we're looking at the big picture. And I honestly believe someone who is a vegan really is, it's, an, it's a stage or a pathway of enlightenment. You know, you, you, you start out maybe as a vegetarian and then you move to a vegan, but you understand they're sentient beings, right? They're sentient beings who should be respected and they have rights. And, you know, just because somebody, you know, feels that it's okay, it's, it's what is the word when they were killing them recently in Hong Kong, we had hamsters being killed because the government thought that the hamsters had COVID. So instead of putting them into um, isolation, right, quarantine, which they're already in quarantine, they're in a cage, right, or giving them a shot, the government decided to kill over 3,000 hamsters just as a, you know, as a knee-jerk reaction. But the point of that is that, you know, um, ignorance is not going to propel us into any place that's good in the future. It's about education and understanding the rights of animals, right? Even, even small little hamsters, right? So we need to all work together. And I hope that, you know, some people here today hear what we're talking about, think about it, move on. And then after we've planted that seed, it grows into something more, um, in something more for the future. It is true. I totally understand what you're talking about because um, I was a student myself and like one professor planted seeds in me and that's how I came to the animal law path. And right. what unites us all vegans and vegetarians, maybe, maybe they're at their starting point, um, is that we're doing this for the, not only for the animals, but also for the planet and for other human beings human Absolutely. and non-human animals Absolutely. Um, okay so yeah we have another question do you have a rough statistics of top countries doing shark finning specifically for the shark fin soup purpose what I'm sorry I need to understand that person what do you mean by top countries are doing shark finning so you know what's interesting is the sharks are being caught in places like this Costa Rica, right? Uruguay, um, um, uh, where else? Florida, California, um, Spain, Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, um, you know, Malaysia, Thailand. It's all the sharks are being caught everywhere in the world. But what's driving the fishermen to catch the sharks, right? Then fin the sharks is the buying is the is the shark fin soup is the is remember we talked about squalene right the the shark liver oil it's the products that the manufacturers are using from the shark that are driving the killing so you know the finning's being done all over the world all right and now we're killing the shark we're finning it but we're also using the whole shark where we used to kind of throw overboard the shark and not keep it, that's really not happening anymore. More and more fishermen are purposefully going after sharks because of the high value of their body. Okay, thank you. I hope it answers the question. Oh, the yeah, answer. yeah. <laughs> they can always um, reach out to me if they want to. Yeah. Um, 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 next question. As far as I know, parts of the shark fin products and dishes in mainland China are fake and made of um, rice noodles. What is your attitude towards this? Do these fake shark products or alternatives help sharks? Well, of course, if you eat a fake shark fin soup, of course it helps a shark because it doesn't kill a shark, right? But that's not my understanding. Um, first of all, when you're in China, um, and Zhao can probably tell you this, um, you know, when you're in China, uh, actually, unless you're in a seafood restaurant, you're not actually going to find shark fin soup in a Chinese restaurant. 
Like if you're in Beijing and, and you're sitting down at a traditional Beijing restaurant, you're going to have soy jiaos, right? You're going to have dumplings, right? You're going to have mian, you're going to have noodles, rice. Shark fin soup is really something that goes along with Cantonese food and seafood restaurants. It's really a Southern delicacy. So when I was going to school in China, I went to law school in China. We would go to Chinese restaurants all the time. I never saw a bowl of shark fin soup. It's when I came and moved to Hong Kong 30 years ago that it was so prevalent in my community, right? That when the company I was working at when I first came here, we went to a big banquet and there was shark fin soup. And I was like, oh, I've never had this. And I was eating away and everything. I had no idea, right? I had to be educated, right? And, and to learn that my actions have consequences. And the consequences I have is that I was negligently contributing to the destruction of the species by eating that shark fin soup. So, you know, I hope that people understand that um, even though China is the origin of it, a lot of Chinese people have never eaten shark fin soup before. I am not aware of a lot of fake shark fin soup. But if there is a lot of fake shark fin soup out there, that's excellent. I think it's fantastic. Um, you know, I even go to a, a vegan um, uh, a dim sum restaurant right by my house. I live in um, the shark capital of the world, the shark fin capital of the world. Where I live in is Sang Poon in Hong Kong. I walk out my door and within five minutes, I can see hundreds of thousands of sharks every day, right? And it's just soul destroying. But I go to a little restaurant and to get my yum ta or my dim sum, and um, they have shark fin dumplings, right? I, I don't buy them. But hey, you know, if somebody wants to eat that because, it, you know, it's not hurting any animal, it's all plant based, I say more power to you. Yeah, I think it's pretty fantastic if people could recreate something similar i think it's um something like fake chicken or fake sure. cheese or fake beef. why not yeah right yeah but, I mean, uh, at, as long as animals don't suffer it's fine i guess yes, of course but look at i don't know about where you are you know lou in kazakhstan but here in hong kong the alternative protein industry has just taken off right it's just, you have many vegan restaurants, you have many products you can have. Um, there's one guy named David Young, and he owns a company called Green Common. And he um, has come out with um, uh, alternative protein fish and tuna fish. And tonight I had a nice fillet of fake fish with my you know green vegetables that I had and a salad. And it was nice, you know, it was really good. And hats off to entrepreneurs like that. I think it's fantastic. That is, you know, that is a way that we're going to save the ocean. And again, I mentioned Seaspiracy. If you haven't seen Seaspiracy, people, please see that movie to understand the big picture and how you, by eating sushi, by eating, you know, tuna fish, by eating these animal products, you're actually contributing to the problem and if you're silent about it you're still complicit yeah in case um, in case you didn't watch um it's a very good documentary it's so informative and i was just like wow i'm not a fan of documentaries but when i saw this on netflix i was like wow i was so impressed by the work they did uh it was really cool <laughs> And remember, a documentary um, is the view, right, of the, the director and the producer. It's their view. It's a documentary of how they see the world. So, of course, when that movie came out, there was a huge backlash by many different organizations, especially WWF, because they're quite complicit with a lot of these organizations, and also um, by uh, MSC, which is a, a seafood, um, how do I describe them? They are an organization that um, uh, says that, you know, uh, seafood can be eaten in moderation, right? 
and sustainable seafood. So they're a company that chops, um, say, tuna fish companies, right? Tuna fish companies, they'll come along and say it's dolphin free when it's not true. It's not, right? So, I mean, it was an eye opener even for me as an animal rights activist. I learned so much. I mean, I've seen that movie. I watched that movie five times because I had to keep going back and look and then fact checking, right? But um, yeah, it's a, it's a great watch, definitely. Yeah, that's true. I totally agree and totally recommend this. Um, we have uh, the last question. Um, what challenges would you list while advocating against the shark fin soup in Asian region? Uh, and uh, what is the public perception locally in Hong Kong? Sorry, you, you cut out there, it dropped out. Can you repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, what challenges would you list while advocating against the shark fin soup in Asian region? And what is the public perception locally in Hong Kong? Great, great. Well, the biggest challenges we have, right? So we're really into education and talking to kids. The biggest challenges we have are not from the kids. They're so switched on. Young people just get it, right? They understand cause and effect. They totally get their actions, have reactions. It's getting to the older generation that own the money, that have the purse strings, that are buying the shark fin, right? So a lot of young people say to me, oh, I, I won't buy shark fin soup. I won't eat it. But something called passive consumption happens. And passive consumption is where, okay, Lou, you decide um, you would never eat it, but then you get married, right? And your grandmother is paying for the wedding. And she says, you want me to pay for the wedding? You better have shark fin soup because I want everybody at the wedding to be impressed, right? And I want to get a lot of face from this wedding. Passive consumption is our one of our biggest problems, right? It's convincing kids to stay by their guns, stay by their principles, right? And to not be influenced by this old tradition of how to get face. You know, we don't get face by killing an endangered species just so we can look good at our, on the day of our wedding, right? In fact, it's the opposite. And that's why shark heroes like that lady, Bonnie, she is a part of our shark free wedding campaign a couple of years ago. You know, that challenge is getting the young people to stick by their principles and not give in to an older generation that feels, you know, th that they will lose face. Um, for those of you who have never been to a Chinese wedding, okay, if you go to a Chinese wedding, you actually pay the bride and groom for the wedding. You give a lycee red packet of like a thousand Hong Kong dollars, which is like um, 120 US, right? So you give like a hundred US dollars for the wedding. Then the restaurant actually charges the bride and groom, let's say $50. And then the bride and groom pocket $50, okay? So that is a way that they make bride and grooms make money in a Chinese wedding, right? They, they make a little money off it, then they can buy their own gifts, et cetera. But I think um, what people don't realize is that if you don't have the really expensive items at the wedding, people will whisper behind your back and say, wow, they're really cheap, right? And, you do, and, and the old generation is really worried about that. So that's one of our biggest challenges. And that's why I think it's important for us to be a farmer and plant those seeds of change. The second um, question, part of your question was, um, what is the public attitude towards shark fin soup? You know, everybody I talk to says, almost, I say 99% of everybody I talk to says, I never eat shark fin soup. But when I walk out the door and go to um, the grocery store or walk around my neighborhood, there are thousands of shops selling shark fin soup. So either they are buying it or they're not buying it. Um, sadly, I think that um, people understand the problem, but they still want to buy it and have it at those big times of year, like Chinese New Year and birthdays and, and Friday night dinners. 
So it's changing that attitude, as I mentioned, is our biggest challenge. But um, uh, the public is, is slowly being convinced. And I think by the fact that the Hong Kong government recently changed the law uh, last year, I think that's a big help for us moving forward. Thank you so much for answering all our questions. Um, and I think that's it for, for the questions. Um, thank you so much, Andrea, for doing this talk today. Um, I was very glad to host you as my guest speaker and probably that would be the concluding presentation within my uh, project on aquatic animals. And I was so happy to have a person who could speak about sharks and concluding this kind of uh, project because I'm so passionate about sharks. Um, for those who um, will still have questions, you can send uh, you can send me an email and ask um, the they ask um, ask for the email of the speaker or just contact Andrea directly. Um, and the recording will be available um, probably next week. Uh, you you will find the recording on our website and um, on our YouTube channel. And um, yeah, um, thank you again, Andrea, and um, have a great weekend. <laughs> Thank you very much and happy new year to you and anybody out there who is um, is going yeah. to celebrate next week. And I'm so glad to be a part of um, your project. And I hope, look forward to, and I hope that we can find a way that we can work together again in the future. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be you, really you are, and your organization, you are our future. So um, yeah, keep up the hope and keep up the good work. Thank you so much. Thank you, dear. Okay. Have a good weekend, everybody. TGIF. <laughs> Thanks.